It ages our cells. We know that because it changes telomere length, which is a marker for biological aging. And it changes us on the outside because it's the, it's the cause of wrinkles. It causes wrinkles, cataracts, and um, cardiovascular disease because it causes decreased flexibility of your arteries, including your coronary arteries. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. Sugar's negative effects on the human body are better known today than ever before. These include metabolic disorders and weakened immune systems and much more. So why is it that so many of us still seek out the sweet stuff, knowing very well that it's not good for us? This is episode 252, and our guest today is Dr. Robert Lustig. Robert is an endocrinologist, a professor, author, and sugar expert. Today, Robert helps us understand why we find sugar so addicting and what we can do about it. But he also digs deep into sugar's detrimental effects. He describes in detail what sugar does to us on a cellular level, including glycation and oxidative stress. He explains how it messes with mitochondrial function and leads to a cluster of diseases that we generally attribute to aging, such as cancer, dementia, diabetes, and fatty liver disease. Importantly, Robert gives us ideas on how to avoid our exposure to sugar and why it's so critical to do so, particularly with all that's going on today. Before we get into it, a quick shout out to our sponsors. Green Pasture, if you're looking for a way to help fill nutritional gaps in your diet and give your immune system a boost, check out Green Pasture products. Their fermented cod liver oil and high vitamin butter oil are a great natural source of vitamins A and D, as well as omega fatty acids. Boost your health today. Visit greenpasture.org to place your order. And this episode is brought to you in part by Grass-Fed Intestines with Tripe by Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements makes New Zealand-sourced, nose-to-tail, organ meats, bone marrow, and intestines in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. Intestines, stomach, tripe, and other gelatinous parts provided concentrated amounts of connective tissue, undenatured collagen, probiotics, and other gut-specific proteins that are now absent from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Rob. My pleasure, Hilda. Thanks for having me. Well, we've all heard by now that sugar is bad for us. If we have heard the message so much, why is it that we're still consuming it so much, Rob? Uh, Well, for the same reason we've heard that opioids are bad for us, and we're still consuming those too. And nicotine's bad for us, but we're still smoking cigarettes. And that's the definition of addiction. You know that something is hurting your uh, health, your family, your economy, your community, your livelihood, and you're powerless to stop it. The difference is that for nicotine or for heroin or for street drugs, you know you're consuming it. For sugar, you don't know it because it's in all the food and has been put there by the food industry specifically to keep you coming back. And you don't know that you're consuming it. You don't know that there's sugar in your salad dressing. You don't know that there's sugar in your bread. You know, so if you don't know, then how would you be able to do anything about it? Right. And we think we have weak willpower, right? Because we're like, oh, I guess I just, I don't know why I can't stop eating this, whatever it is, bread or chips or what have you. And it's because that sugar in there is keeping us addicted, or at least that's part of the equation, I guess. Well, once upon a time, we didn't even have the phenomenon of addiction. We just basically assumed everyone had weak willpower. Now we know a little bit more about the uh, the nature of the psychiatry involved in addiction. And so we now classify it as a disease rather than just a character flaw. The fact of the matter is everyone is addictable to sugar. That doesn't mean everyone is addicted, kind of like alcohol. So 40% of Americans are teetotalers. They don't touch the stuff. 40% are social drinkers like me. You know, you can pick up a beer and put it down and it's no problem. You know, on the other hand, 20% have a hardcore problem and 10% are honest to goodness, you know, alcoholics. So what determines which uh, of those bins you're in? Well, it's probably about the same for sugar. 
And we don't know what those are yet. We uh, have some data on it, but, you know, we're still trying to ferret out, you know, what constitutes sugar addiction in which which patient. Right. And so let's say I fall into the bin of I can handle it. It's um, I'm not addicted. You know, I can kind of take it or leave it. Is it still doing the damage to me that it's doing to the person who can't let it go? Absolutely. It's doing it to everybody uh, because of the nature of the biochemistry of the fructose molecule. So fructose and glucose are the two molecules in dietary sugar. So sugar cane, high fructose corn syrup, whatever. Glucose, for lack of a better word, is safe. It's not really safe, but it's not nearly as bad as fructose. Mm -hmm. Glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. Glucose is necessary for life. It is not necessary to eat for life because your body makes it, but it's not very sweet. Yeah, Do you see it. people going around chugging caro syrup? That's glucose. Do you see <laughs> people going around chugging molasses? That's glucose. Okay. Molasses is okay in a cookie, but I mean, you know, does anybody actually like go drink black shot molasses? Really? No. No. <laughs> Fructose, on the other hand, is the other molecule in sugar, and it's very sweet. And it is completely vestigial to all vertebrate, all eukaryotic life. There is no biochemical reaction in the body that requires dietary fructose, but it is the part of sugar, it is the molecule that stimulates the reward center. Glucose doesn't, fructose does. And so anything that stimulates the reward center is going to keep you coming back for more because this feels good. I want more. And in the extreme, it leads to addiction. So fructose is the molecule that leads to addiction. And fructose is the molecule that makes sugar addictive and makes it, you know, the problem that it is. Now, the reason fructose is a problem is not because of its addiction. The reason is because of its toxic side effects. And it does two things that glucose does not. One is it makes the liver turn fructose into liver fat. And that liver fat drives chronic metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And the second thing it does is it drives the aging or the browning or the Maillard reaction. The reason bananas brown, the reason we paint our ribs with barbecue sauce, the reason we have wrinkles, the reason we have cataracts, that's all fructose binding to proteins in our body. And when it does that, it makes those proteins less flexible. If it happens in your arteries, that gives you arteriosclerosis or hypertension. If it happens in your brain, you get Alzheimer's disease. So this phenomenon of glycation of the Maillard reaction, which is driven by fructose seven times faster than glucose, is the reason why it causes all of these metabolic disturbances. Wow. And that is different between fructose and glucose. This is fascinating and mind-blowing. The first bit when you were mentioning about the liver um, kind of getting more fatty, I had heard in the past that, you know, fatty liver disease was seen with a lot of alcoholics, but now I have heard that more and more people have it. Do you think it's because of this intake of Absolutely. Fructose? So why do children get fatty liver disease? They don't drink alcohol. So prior to 1980, if you saw fatty liver disease in a patient or under a microscope, you know, that was alcohol. Okay, in 1980, the first patient was diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And now, today, 20% of all children have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and 45% of all adults. <gasps> but as we've talked about, not that many adults consume alcohol, and it's because they consume sugar instead. And the reason is because fructose and alcohol are metabolized almost exactly the same by the liver. Because after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of fructose, it's called wine. The big difference between the two is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step called glycolysis. For fructose, we do our own first step. But after that, the mitochondria in our liver, the little energy burning factories inside our liver, they don't care where it came from. And when they have to deal with an excess, then they get sick. And so it can be alcohol or it can be fructose. It could also be branched chain amino acids, which is what's in corn fed beef, or it could be trans fats. All four of those are metabolized virtually identically in the liver. And so they all contribute 
to metabolic syndrome. So Rob, when you look around at the population, are you kind of internally saying to yourself, if only they knew this information, like I feel like people are burdening their bodies and they really just think it's a harmless little habit to have an extra piece of fruit after dinner or to have that piece of pie, right? Well, so fruit's not as bad. And the reason fruit's not as bad is because fruit has fiber and the fiber limits the absorption in the GI tract so that less of it gets to the liver in the first place and more of it ends up feeding your intestinal bacteria. So fruit in its native form is fine. Fruit juice, where the fiber has been stripped away, that's a problem. Now the pie is a different story. So the fruit is not the problem, the pie is the problem, okay? So let's be you know clear about what's going on. Mm -hmm. But would it make a difference to people if they knew this? It would to some, and it has to some. Unfortunately, it hasn't to enough people, and it certainly hasn't to the food industry as they continue to apply you know, more and more products with extra added sugar on purpose because they know that when they do, you buy more. And what is that metabolic syndrome that you mentioned? What does that look like? So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of diseases, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, lipid problems, polycystic ovarian disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cancer, dementia. These are all chronic metabolic diseases that have at its core mitochondrial dysfunction, that these mitochondria are not doing what they're supposed to do. And because of it, these various phenomena occur. There are actually eight, count of eight subcellular pathologies that belie these diseases of metabolic syndrome. And I can name them for you. And fructose drives them all. Mm. Number one, glycation. So glucose binding to proteins, like I just described, the Maillard reaction. Oxidative stress. So every time that reaction occurs, a little hydrogen peroxide gets released, which can do, do its own damage like what you you know put on your wound on your skin but if that happens inside a cell you know all that bubble and fizz that mm -hmm. occurs inside your cell and could kill your cell mm -hmm. uh, mitochondrial dysfunction because your mitochondria aren't burning and so they turn it into liver fat insulin resistance because that extra liver fat drives uh, pancreatic insulin secretion because the liver is not doing its job pancreas has to make more insulin membrane instability so the membranes of your cell have to be deformable. Uh, and when they're not, then the cell can break and that releases its contents and that causes inflammation and the inflammation that comes with that. Methylation, which is when DNA gets a methyl group on it and it changes whether or not it gets transcribed properly or not. And it can alter various metabolic processes in the, in the body. And then finally, lastly, autophagy. Autophagy is clearing out old, dead, senescent cellular debris so that you know it doesn't it doesn't build up kind of like garbage night mm -hmm. okay if you don't if you don't have garbage night your house is going to stink pretty fast uh, if you don't uh, get rid of all the excess junk you're going to end up very sick very fast and fructose basically damages each one of those eight subcellular pathologies and each of those belie these chronic metabolic diseases that we currently attribute to metabolic syndrome we assume these are diseases of aging. They are not. They are diseases of diet. We need to stick with that for just a second because I had heard that sugar ages us, Rob, but I thought they just meant it ages our appearance. You're saying it actually ages us on the inside. Oh, absolutely. It ages our cells. We know that because it changes telomere length, which is a marker for biological aging. And it changes us on the outside because it's the, it's the cause of wrinkles. Mm -hmm. So the more sugar you consume, I mean, you know, sun too, I mean, sun does its own damage, okay? But sugar does its own damage and it causes wrinkles, cataracts, and um, cardiovascular disease because it causes decreased flexibility of your arteries, including your coronary arteries. Right. And just like we want our muscles and our, our bodies to be agile and flexible in terms of their strength and their ability to, you know, bend over to get something, we want the inside of us to be flexible too. Right. And so the, the, the problem is that there's no medicine for that. The only thing you can do is reduce the exposure, but we can't because our food's been contaminated. What would you recommend that we do then? I suppose if we ate a little bit more like the wise traditions folks do, a little more real whole foods, we're not going to be getting that hidden sugar in there, right? Exactly. Basically, sugar has been added to all processed food, but real food actually is pretty low in sugar. It's low in sugar and high in fiber. 
which is exactly what you want in order to protect your liver and feed your gut. And those are the two things that ultimately determine whether a food is healthy. Any food that does both, protect your liver and feed your gut, that's a healthy food. Any food that does neither, that's poison. Any food that does one or the other, but not both, it's kind of in the middle somewhere. Real food does both. And real food doesn't usually come on the supermarket shelf with a label with words you can't pronounce on the ingredient list, right? <laughs> and, and that's what I tell people is if a food comes with a label, it's a warning label. Coming up, Robert talks about the direct and indirect effects of sugar on the immune system and its role in making us more vulnerable to viruses. You're listening to the Wise Traditions podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Many parents struggle to provide the nutrition their family needs for good health. The modern diet is honestly lacking in essential nutrients and common vitamins are often unreliable and synthetic. That's why Green Pasture Products offers fermented cod liver oil and concentrated butter oil that can help fill your family's nutritional gaps and provide a boost to your health so you can all thrive. Their oils are a great natural source of vitamins A and D and omega fatty acids. Our family takes Green Pasture fermented cod liver oil regularly to round out the diet. So go to greenpasture.org and place your order today. And this episode is brought to you in part by Grass-Fed Intestines with Tripe by Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements makes New Zealand sourced, nose to tail, organ meats, bone marrow, and intestines in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. According to the great John Fire Lame Deer, the eating of guts evolved into a contest. Quote, in the old days, we used to eat the guts of the buffalo, making a contest of it. Two fellows getting hold of a long piece of intestines from opposite ends, starting chewing toward the middle, seeing who can get there first. That's eating. Those buffalo guts, full of half-fermented, half-digested grass and herbs, you didn't need any pills and vitamins when you swallowed those, end quote. Intestines, stomach, tripe, and other gelatinous parts provided concentrated amounts of connective tissue, undenatured collagen, probiotics, and other gut-specific proteins that are now absent from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Kilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Now, the one thing we haven't talked about yet, Rob, is how sugar affects our immune system. Can you speak to that? Sure. So sugar has direct and indirect effects on the immune system. The direct effect is probably mediated through leaky gut. And leaky gut is a phenomenon in the intestine. This is a little complicated, but I'll try to explain it. You know, your intestine is outside your body, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a tube that runs through your body and nutrients get broken down into single molecules and then get absorbed across the intestinal epithelium and into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. But most of the other junk stays in your intestine and goes out in your poop. Mm -hmm. But the cells of your intestine, they approximate each other and they don't let stuff get across that shouldn't get across. And the way those cells approximate each other is they have junctions that keep them tight and they're called tight junctions. Hmm. And these tight junctions are uh, have a protein called zonulins. These are the proteins that are defective in celiac disease. And what happens is when those zonulins are defective, the cells aren't able to approximate each other. They can basically develop pores through which bacteria or toxins from the intestine can get into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And we call that leaky gut. And then when those toxins get into the bloodstream, your immune system will get hyperreactive to those. So you'll end up developing, say, an autoimmune disease or potentially a food allergy, or, you know, you'll generate white cells against, you know, toxins, which will cause inflammation, which will generate metabolic syndrome. So all three of these things, food allergies and uh, autoimmune disease and metabolic syndrome have all been going up in the last 50 years since the advent of processed food. So this concept of leaky gut is very clear and very real. The question is, how does fructose in particular manage that? How does it make that happen? And that's still a matter of research. It's a you know bone of contention. Mm -hmm. But what we think is that fructose depletes the intestinal cells of ATP, which is the energy of the cell. Mm -hmm. And those zonulins, those uh, proteins that keep the uh, 
keep the integrity of the intestine, the ones that are defective in celiac, those are ATP dependent. So what would happen to cells that are trying to approximate each other when you take away their energy source? Leaky gut. So we know that sugar drives endotoxin production in the bloodstream, which you can then treat with antibiotics, which is not a good thing to do in humans for all sorts of reasons. But you know, experimentally, we know that that happens. Mm-hmm. We can measure the lipopolysaccharide, the, you know, the, the toxic substance that bacteria give off in the blood of animals and humans after they've consumed a sugar, high sugar meal. So we think that through intestinal changes, it is leading to alterations in our immune system because of the traversing of the intestinal barrier by toxins that are supposed to stay inside the gut lumen, but end up in the bloodstream because of the dissociation of the integrity of the intestine. This is amazing. And this proves my little theory. I would always tell my mom, mom, stop drinking soda. I'm like, sugar isn't just neutral. I was like, it's a robber. It's stealing you of things. But I didn't realize it was stealing the ATP. And that's the direct effect. Then there are indirect effects because Mm. anything that generates a high insulin level is going to also alter your uh, immune system uh, through changes in toll-like receptors on cells like what vitamin D uh, acts on. You know, vitamin D is an immune modulator as well. It's also, you know, this whole COVID-19 thing has really made, you know, brought this to the fore. And it turns out that the portal into cells for COVID-19 is called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. It's a hormone receptor that, you know, as an endocrinologist, I deal with. And it turns out that that's the door that the virus uses to inject its RNA into the cell to make the next cell infected and replicate, you know, drive the disease. Mm -hmm. So turns out insulin regulates ACE2. So the higher your insulin goes, the more doors you have for COVID-19 to infect you and possibly kill you. And so it's been shown now numerous times in numerous cities that all the patients who are dying of the disease fall into three categories, black, obese, and pre-existing conditions. And all of those are the diseases of metabolic syndrome like diabetes. Well, what do those three demographic groups share? Processed food. Wow. So was that first category African-Americans? 60% more sugar per capita than Caucasians do. And they have way higher insulin levels. And yet, without a thought, as you were saying, these food companies keep promoting their sugar-laden, touting these poisons as, as wonderful foods for people, and, and they're Absolutely. wreaking havoc we're on the population. We're trying to do something about that, but it is a very heavy lift, as you can imagine, especially because when people are stressed, what do they do? They go for the processed food. And so if you go to the store, you'll see what's missing, the pasta, the breakfast cereal, and the candy which is exactly the wrong things to be Mm. purchasing now. Well, Rob, that leads me to my next question. Let's say we're ready to roll. We're like, okay, (laughs) you've converted me. I want to go lower sugar, if not, you know, no sugar. Very simple. Where would I start with that? Be careful at the grocery store. If it has a label, it's a warning label. That almost always means that it's been processed in some fashion. And most of the time what's happened is that the fiber has been removed for shelf life and the sugar has been added for palatability. And so you have to be very wary. So shop around the outside of the supermarket, as so many people have told you, you know, the meats, the dairy, the uh, produce, and, you know, pretty much anything that's on a shelf must be considered toxic until proven otherwise is the way you should really approach the supermarket. Best to go to a, uh, not Whole Foods, but a, 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 a farmer's market where they're selling produce and meats, you know, without processing. But, you know, that gets expensive. And we recognize that, you know, eating right is unfortunately a privilege in this country, not a right. And it's a, uh, it's one of these things that uh, distinguishes uh, social disparities in terms of disease. And it's through this mechanism. Basically, processed food has to be considered poison at this point. And, you know, anybody who, you know, consumes it is uh, leaving themselves vulnerable. Well, these are wise words. I know Dr. Price would agree with you wholeheartedly. Our foundation's first principle is to avoid denatured and refined foods. So you're right on target with what you're saying, and I hope we can take these to heart. And I want to ask you, Rob, the question I often pose at the end, if the listener could do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? The standard answer, that is the single one thing. 
The problem, of course, is that people think Cheetos is food. And as long as you think Cheetos is food, there's no hope for you. It's just that simple. So at this point in time, you have to read labels. And I think that reading labels sucks. And the information that you really need to know isn't even on the label. And I'm actually writing a book now. It will be out next year. Right now, the title of the provisional title is Food Pharma Feds Fiasco. And what I will argue in this book is that it's not what's in the food, it's what's been done to the food that matters. All food is inherently good. It's what we did to the food that's not. And unfortunately, what we did to the food is not listed on the label. So the information you need to know is not even provided to you. But there are some things you can glean that will help in terms of your understanding what you are putting in your mouth. If, have you ever seen a real uh, farm fresh egg? Oh, yes. The yolk is not yellow. It is orange, deep orange. I love that. There are a lot of people who think, oh, that egg is spoiled because it is deep orange. <laughs> No, actually, that egg is filled with omega threes, <laughs> which is exactly what you want because the animal ate it was pasture raised as opposed to uh, you know on a CAFO mm -hmm. concentrated animal feeding operation uh, where they get basically crap to eat. Mm -hmm. So there are things you can know and things you can do to try to up the game on your um, on your uh, own food intake. And you have to be able to, you have to be a discerning shopper. Yes. And actually we have a shopping guide. I think it's available online for like $3. We only include brands that we believe in that maybe like you're saying, have better uh, ingredient lists, if, if any. <laughs> and that reminds me, do you have any kind of guide so people could know like what the code words are for sugar on the ingredient list or anything like that? Maybe we could make that available to the listener. Well, it's, it's actually on our website, my uh, nonprofit's website called Eat Real. Mm. And there are 56 names for sugar. Actually, there are more than that. But we, you know, I actually wrote a, an ebook called Sugar Has 56 Names, A Shopper's Guide. Uh, there are names for sugar that you've never heard of before. You know, Demerara, Panocha, ah. you know, all sorts of things that you didn't know were sugar. And the reason is because the food industry can list the ingredients, uh, you know, by mass. So a different sugar can be number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine. When you add it up, it's number one. Okay. And you don't know that because they're further down the list and they do that on purpose so that you don't know what you're getting. So it's a big problem. And, you know, unfortunately the uh, USDA and the FDA allow the food industry to get away with this on purpose so that they can sell food around the world. What do you mean? So they can sell food around the world? Well, the food industry you know, I mean, we have exported our food to the rest of the world and they make money. And guess what? Our government makes money on the tariffs. So it's good for them. It's good for the government. It's good for the food industry. It's bad for us. And, you know, if we actually told people what was on the, uh, in the food, uh, they probably wouldn't buy it. That's right. They think that what's on the store shelves is food, as you're saying, but it's actually a Franken food, as some people call it. So well, that's one way to consider it. I mean, basically, it's what's been done to the food mm -hmm. that matters. You know, until we have a rational labeling and classification system, you know, we're still going to end up being in this boat. There is a system out of Brazil called the Nova system that classifies food based on its uh, degree of processing. Uh, so there's Nova classes one through four. And four is the ultra processed food where there's more than five ingredients and, you know, things have been taken out and things have been added in. Numerous studies have now shown that it is that class four that causes disease. Wow. You know, this is, so this would be a food classification system we here in the United States could adopt. Mm -hmm. But of course, the USDA will have nothing to do with it because then the food industry would be behind the eight ball. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. I might mention that uh, I wrote a real food cookbook oh. back in 2014 called The Fat Chance Cookbook. Our nonprofit has put the contents of the cookbook online for free so that people during this COVID-19 pandemic have access to real food recipes that they can then make at home all one half hour or less. Uh, the most complicated piece of equipment you need is a blender. And they're all vetted by uh, Mount Diablo High School students to be producible, consumable, and delicious. That's wonderful. Thank you so much again, Rob. This has been great. My pleasure. Thank you. Our guest today was Dr. Robert Lustig. 
Visit his website, robertlustig.com, for more resources. And I'm Holistic Hilda. You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the show notes for this and every podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent review from Apple Podcasts. Love the fearless content is how Mrs. Ford starts. The content shared on this show is fabulous. There is no topic too taboo to discuss, and it is so refreshing to have a resource for this vital information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ford, for your review. You guys, if you love this podcast, go for it. Rate and review it on Apple Podcasts, and we may read your very review on an upcoming episode. Thank you so much for listening, my friend. Stay well. Y hasta pronto. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.